Hello, Open Heart Project. Hello, Daily Dharma gathering gatherers. Mm -hmm. It is so great to be here with you. It is so great to be here with Byron Katie and Stephen Mitchell. Uh, to just be with them is a delight. And to talk about uh, their new book, A Mind at Home with Itself, which is a beautiful, beautiful read, uh, kind of uh, hopeful, helpful, shocking in some ways. And uh, as Stephen described Katie in one of the pages, <laughs> I love this description, helpfully alarming. <laughs> so welcome. Um, it is so wonderful that you're here. Thank um, you very much for being here. Thank you, Susan. Our thank pleasure. you. Um, so it has been a pleasure to read this book. It has been a pleasure to learn about the process that you call the work. And it has also been, as a busy Buddhist, mm -hmm. a delight to ex just feel the cohesion between, for me, my Buddhist studies and this work. It seems that there is no difference. And everybody here in the Open Heart Project is a meditator. And I guess what I would say to you, and if you're not familiar mm -hmm. with the work, is that Meditation is something we do off the cushion, on the cushion, and the work is something that you can do off the cushion that is meditation too. So I wonder if you wouldn't mind just sharing a little bit about the work, what it is, and how you came to it. The, the work is simply a way to identify the judgments, assumptions, the thoughts that we're thinking to identify them and question them. So it's a way to, um, honey, you have a good description for it, what is it? Well, I think that's an excellent description. And it's particularly, um, the work, I, I find the work is particularly useful for meditators in that the thoughts that, that rise and fall during meditation aren't necessarily the core thoughts that are causing your suffering. So what the work does, I, I sometimes think of it as uh, like a, an anti-snake bite medicine that you apply and it brings the poison to the surface so that you can actually deal with it. So I, I've known um, quite a few me meditators, who, some of whom have been doing Buddhist meditation for decades, who during an intensive period of the work find out that they have been driving themselves crazy with thoughts that they were never even aware of. So it's a it's an extremely powerful adjunct to Buddhist practice, in my experience. And also this inquiry invites, it's a hunger for the mind. In other words, a love affair. And it invites like every thought, welcome here. Every thought, it's like a show me, show me. And, you know, here they come, invited or not, but it is a hunger to see what's true and what's not, what's illusion and and what is real and what is not for, uh, what matches the heart and what is foreign to the heart. And it's um, it, it's a practice. There's no doubt about that. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a practice and um, it takes stillness and devotion to the love of truth. Oh. It's it's kind of a diff, uh, another type of incarnation of the spirit of inquiry, which is something that it's uh, really vital to have in any kind of meditative practice. And um, and one of the brilliant elements in the work is that early on, Katie realized that it was important for people to write down these thoughts because in her words, that's how you stop the mind, because uh, the, the, the uh, egoistic mind is really tricky and that when you're actually doing inquiry on a thought, it, it may wriggle out and change forms and transmogrify into something that's less threatening to the ego, ego. so mm -hmm. that once you write it down on a piece of paper, you have it um, kind of fixed in time, and then you can really apply Katie's four questions, the four questions of the work, which are, is it true? Can you absolutely know that it's true? How do you react? What happens when you believe that thought, which is the cause and effect of it? 
and yeah. emotions and everything is there. And how do you react when you believe the thought? Mm-hmm. You know, we see what, how we live out of that. We see the images of past future in our mind's eye and we are reacting out of that. And and it's where we say and do things that cause guilt, which which cements that past as though it's um, it's you know it haunts us. It's it's like breeding ground for guilt. And then that fourth question: Who would I be in that same situation if I didn't believe the thought? Mm. Would you be without your story? Would you be without the thought in that same point in time? Mm-hmm. And and um, and it's um, it really will show one's identity up. And in that, it um, it's. It's as though it begins to, we begin to get the joke and it kind of falls away and then the next trickster will come <laughs> and to welcome it, you know, to, to welcome it and and see, you know, it, it's like, is it valid? Mind, are you valid? And right. to question it and test it. And it's it's very exciting, obviously, when I speak to it, it never gets old because I'm, I'm, it, you, you mentioned sitting on the cushion. It, it's like we don't have to leave the cushion just because we're walking and talking and yeah. going to work and rocking our children. You know, it's just, it's, it's, we, you know, we don't leave that cushion once inquiry is alive in us. It's an inner world that, that, you know, if, if, if I meet someone and, and let's say I hold a grudge on them, then, I don't hold a grudge on that person. I what I'm thinking and believing onto that person is just like slapping post-its all over them. <laughs> so, so they show up and they say, "Hi, how are you?" And I slap all these post-its on them as though mm-hmm. that is that person. And, and so, you know, I'm I'm not talking to that person. I'm talking to this 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 um, identity I believe them to be. And, and so, you know, no wonder we're confused in the world. Yeah, and it, it can feel so unkind. And you, I can feel when someone's doing that to me, when they're not talking to me, they're talking to some, someone who they're seeing. And it, it feels like an incredible unkindness. And, and, and if, if I do that onto you, it is a terrible unkindness. And it's my responsibility to question what I'm believing about you so that I can see you. I yeah. can know you. Because mm-hmm. believing onto you doesn't show me you. Right. Well, I found a little something on the Internet called the Judge Your Neighbor Worksheet. Mm. And I filled it out. And I was wondering if you wouldn't mind hearing it or talking with me about it. So let's do, read, read uh, what did you write for on um, the first one? I will tell you. And for you who are listening, please put your own stories, put your own feelings, put your own examples in here, and I'll show you where you can find this worksheet so you could do this yourself. So I wrote, this is something that happened to me like 10 years ago, but suddenly mm-hmm. it's been plaguing me again. I am angry with Duncan, who is my husband, because he didn't help me when I begged him to come be with me when I was struggling. So he didn't help you. So you see that situation in your mind's eye. You're begging him to help you. So you see, where where are you when you were thinking that? I was in... I mean, where where were you when you were begging him at the time? I was on the phone in my apartment in New York City, and he was here. Okay. So, um, angry at Duncan because he didn't help you when you begged him to be with you. Okay? So he didn't help you. Mm-hmm. So be there in, in that situation. He didn't help you. Is it true? Yes. He didn't. I asked him to help, and he said no. So he didn't help you. Can you absolutely know that it's true he didn't help you? No. I can't. Maybe there was something in his refusal that was beneficial. So just be with that a minute. Mm. Now in that situation, notice 
how you reacted, what happened when you believed the thought that he didn't help you? I thought, I can't trust him. When I really need him, he won't be there for me. So you lost trust? Now feel the emotions that happened in that moment you believed the thought he didn't help you. He's not helping you when you begged him to. I felt scared. I felt lonely. I felt righteous, like you should help someone who you're in a relationship with. I felt abandoned, really abandoned. And you feel, will you feel that in your body? Yeah, I do. I feel it right here. Yeah. So, so keep that image of you in that situation. It's very important because that's what we're meditating on, that oh. moment in time. I'm witnessing you. I mean, I don't know where you were, were calling from, but I have you even in a phone booth. So, so um, now witness you in that same situation. And that fourth question, who would you be in that same situation without the thought he didn't help you? He's not helping you. I would just help myself. I guess I would just okay. feel but, but, like, but, but look at you in the phone booth or yeah. wherever you are on that phone where you are. Other than what you're thinking and believing, are you okay? Yeah. Yeah. I so, get, yeah. so you take all the post-its off of you. <laughs> look at you. Where are you? Where are you on the phone? I was in I was in an apartment that I was moving out of. And okay. I suddenly became very scared to move, and there was just boxes all around. Okay, and... so look at you. Are you sitting on a, on the bed, on a chair? Are you standing? Everything was packed. I was sitting on the floor. Okay, so look, look at you on the floor, and look around, and look at you. I don't know what you're thinking and believing. Are you okay? You know, I want to say on yes, from the outside. Yeah. But on the inside, I was kind of crumbling. I yeah, felt that's why I'm asking you drop your story, witness you there. I mean, you're like a box or the floor. Other than what you're thinking and believing, look at you. There's no harm. There's you're intact. You're wearing clothes. You're fed. You're watered. Look at the stuff around you. There's so much stuff there, you couldn't count the boxes, maybe. <laughs> I mean, look, you have, you have hair. I mean, when, I, when you get still in that and you, you, you take your story away, you begin to experience everything from compassion to, to, to love, from compassion to love to gratitude. Now, do you need anyone in that moment in time? As you witness you there? I don't. It's, I, I, I it's, don't. It's really good to know. In the worst of times, other than what we're thinking and believing, we are so taken care of. That's what, you know, when people are talking about, um, um, what is it that they talk about? Having things, um, being a success, and, and all of that. Well, look at you. Oh, all the stuff around? <laughs> I mean, it's just in that moment. Good to know. Yeah. Now, now look how innocent you are. Other than what you're thinking and believing, there's no problem. Well, that's true. It was completely, I was thinking and feeling, I'm alone, no one cares about me, somebody mm -hmm. should care about me. But actually, yeah. I was... Just sitting in a room with some boxes. Yeah. So um, he didn't help you turn it around. In that situation, he did. Find an opposite. Yeah, just find an opposite. 
turn turn around by that. I mean, we find opposite, and then we try them on as though we're we, we're in a sh- in a shoe store, and we see this marvelous pair of boots, and we don't know if they're going to be as comfortable as they look or if they'll even fit. So those we we find opposites, and we try them on. I what love is, that. What does that mean to you in in that situation? He didn't help me. Turned around. I didn't help me. I didn't help me. So what does that mean to you as you as as you're more awake to that moment in time now? I didn't comfort myself. I didn't care. Mm. I abandoned myself to a, a, a dependency. To a dependency. I did. I was expecting him to do something. And when people aren't there for us, we, 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 (laughs) our opinion of them definitely changes. Yes, it does. So, so in that situation, we put all those post-its on him and we're, and, and so we're now our identification shifts to, I can depend on him to, I can't trust him. So your identity shifted in that. You were someone that trusted, and now you're someone that doesn't. I mean, look at all the shifts in identity. And even more, there. someone who was betrayed. I felt that. Yeah. So you were, you had a partner, and now you have one that is, is, is full of betrayal. How about I didn't help him? That's just that is just try that one on. That is so powerful. So why why wasn't he uh, coming to be with you in New York City when you were moving? Where is it that you didn't help him when he said, I can't be there? I didn't help him by... I assigned blame to him. I posted it on him. And I have held it on him for 10 years, probably. I mean, I, I love him. We're together. We have a good relationship, mm-hmm. I would say. But that's always in the back. Yeah, he says, good morning. Would you like a cup of tea? And and you, you're not talking to Duncan. You're talking to the Duncan you believe him to be. Right. Did not help him by that particular belief. And you've carried it on him. I have. Yeah. And that's yours. It wasn't his. That came out Mm -hmm. of you. And, And as you go to bed tonight or you shower in the morning or after the call or driving home somewhere, you know, these things continue to work on you. Where have I, where is it that I haven't helped him? Mm-hmm. And you'll just be fed and fed and fed. And that's what I mean by unceasing meditation to live in these questions eventually just becomes um, um, the only world to live out of. The, that inner world to understand it and dance in it and, and just, you know, that, that prayer show me, you know, it's, it, it's, it's a, a way of living that doesn't even need the prayer. We're just shown and shown. And it's um, it's a it's a beautiful thing this internal world when we know how to live out of it. That's yes. And there's a third turnaround. So so what what's another opposite? He didn't help me. I didn't help him. He did help me. He did help you. How did he help me? I have one. Would you like to hear it? I would love to. He forced you to be responsible. That's true. That's true. And you pulled it off. I did. I feel I I hold this coldness in my heart that I can't seem to dissolve around this. So he helped you. Where did he help you? By, By saying, no, I can't come. I just had to rise to the occasion. And so look at you. Did you need him? Mm. 
No, I, I mean, not to accomplish this task. That's what we're talking about. Right. Right. I see another way he did help you. Oh, I'd love he to hear. Ga- he gave you an honest no. Well, that's true. Mm, that's very He was powerful. honest with you. That's like living with Stephen. Living with Duncan sounds like living with Stephen. A no is a no, and 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 it's so uh, refreshing. Right, right. <laughs> he is good at that. Yeah, and he is super honest. So, can I read a little? So let's look at the let's, Yeah, let's. Oh, okay, sorry. Yes, I was going to say let's look at your want. I want. What do I want? This is on the Judge and Abel Number two. Number two. Yeah. Number two. Thank you. Sorry. I want Duncan to believe me that I need him and not judge me by his standards. I want him to love me and show me his love. Okay. That is, those concepts are so juicy to sit in and just walk through all four questions. We're meditating on a moment in time. I want him to believe me. Is that true? This is very deep work when you're sitting in. I want him not to judge me. What kind of um, an open mind doesn't want people to judge them? I don't want him to. You want him judge. to. You want him to believe you. Is that true? Uh, it is. And notice how you react <clears throat> and what happens emotionally and how you treat him on the phone emotionally. Witness your attitude on the phone when you believe the thought that you want him to believe you. Yeah. I get angry and pissy and self-righteous and far from him distant from him. And then you want him to not judge, then you want him not to judge you. Mm -hmm. So you want Duncan to believe you. So witness yourself, who would you be without the thought that you want Duncan to believe you? I would just believe me. I would just be, I wouldn't need that. I could just be with him and he could be with me and it yeah. wouldn't be a thing. I want Duncan to believe me, turn it around. I want me. I want me to believe me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, see, you're not buying it, neither did Duncan. So I want Duncan to believe me. To, he knew you were capable, and maybe you were the last to know, but <laughs> I want Duncan to believe me. Another turnaround. I want me to believe. Duncan? Yeah. So what was he saying to you? I'm not coming. I'm not coming. Not, I'm not coming to New York. And so, I don't think you need me to. So as it turns out, he was right. <laughs> <laughs> so I want me to believe Duncan. So when we're meditating on this, I want me to believe Duncan. And we just see, you know, just just what does that mean to you? I want me to believe Duncan and just get still. And we're shown were shown through images and 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 words and we experience it. We're just witnessing. What I love about the work is we don't have to guess. We ask, we get still, we wait and we're shown. It's a given. But when we ask, it, we we need to be asking from an authentic place. We really, you know, we really have to want to know before something so wise would meet the question. Mm. And I see a third turnaround. Mm. 
I don't want Duncan to believe me. Why, why could that be true? Very juicy. Because I'm, guess because I'm asking him to believe that I am frail when I'm not, actually. And it could also be that you want him to believe whatever he believes. Yeah. It's not as though we can change their minds anyway. That's a, fa that's a fact. Yeah. That's a fact. I mean, the freedom of that, wanting somebody that you love to believe whatever he or she believes is amazing. It means no. we don't ever have to change another person's mind. And and also if I if I if I if Stephen says no, I try to change his mind, he says yes, then um you know, what does that feel like on me? Mm. And also he changes his mind and then I take credit for changing his mind. Mm. But no, it was he that changed his mind. He did that and I'm taking I'm taking um credit for it. All right. Right. So this is, uh, you are pointing to a kind of trust and trustworthiness of reality, I guess you would say, that is sometimes very difficult to hold on to. It's something that, that as we as we sit in this practice, we and meditators are way ahead of the game. You know, they just move a little inquiry into the practice when something is getting their attention. Mm -hmm. And oh my gosh, just sitting in is it true? If you sit in a in um in a in just just sit in, is it true? And and just wait to be shown. All four questions and all the turnarounds show up in that without even asking them if you really get still and, and it's is it true. You know, and Susan, you said you said it's difficult to trust at that level. Mm -hmm. uh, it may be at first, but when you learn how not to believe your own thoughts, it becomes effortless, as effortless as breathing. I mean, you have the freedom yourself and you're only too happy to give that freedom to the people you love. I mean, it's what you want. You want them not to believe you, for example. <laughs> so, so it's really not. Especially when we wake up to we, we're not really believing ourselves. It's there you are capable. And anyway, it all it all shows up on this worksheet. So I want Duncan to believe me. Turned around. I want me to believe me. Would you believe you? I mean, look at you. You pulled it off. I did. Yeah. I, yeah, I don't know yeah. that I would believe me. Yeah. Because yeah. the thought originally was, I want him to believe that I can't do it, really. And that I want thought, him to believe that I need him. Yeah, yeah. and that's, that's You're tantamount. You're frail without him. That's tantamount to I can't do it, which is a really heavy thought. Right. And he married a woman that can. I, so you're shifting identities on him. Right. And neither one of you are buying it. Right. Anyway, wonderful things to sit in. Yes, absolutely. Um, so there's, I would just like to read, if you don't mind, just this, I think this points to what we're talking about here. This from Everything Happens For You, Not To You chapter of book yeah a mind at home with itself a mind at home with itself oh, look it's at that just... beautiful face look at that face <laughs> that is a face that you want to look at uh, so um, a mind at home with itself is is the end of war the end of war with the self is the end of war in one's world so this is really worth you know questioning the mind as it appears is, um, is worth doing. And I interrupted you again, Suzanne. That's quite all right. No, that's quite all right. And it, it unfolds framed by the Diamond Sutra, 
which is so beautiful. And I wonder, Stephen, could you just explain what the Diamond Sutra is? And I would love to know a little bit about how you work together to form this sort of dialogue between the work and the, and the Diamond Sutra, which is like seamless. Like the, the Buddha and with his students, the Bodhi. Yeah, it's, it's, the Diamond Sutra is a dialogue. It was written in about the year 350 of the Common Era by someone who had a very clear vision of the Dharma and, uh, and expressed it by a dialogue between uh, a, a fictional Buddha and his, one of his students, which everybody then believed was the historical Buddha. This is how people used to write scriptures in yeah. those days. So uh, it, it's a, um, a wonderful dialogue that centers on the, uh, the, the issue of generosity. And the central point of the Diamond Sutra is that the, the more you see into the unreality of the concept of self and the fact that there is no difference between self and other, the more you naturally live a life of unfettered generosity. That's, that's the point. Uh, and it's expressed in various ways. Um, one of the famous lines from the sutra is, develop a mind that abides nowhere, or develop a mind that is not dependent on anything you uh, see, hear, taste, touch, or think. Um, so as for the, the way we work together, I, I, it came to me that this uh, sutra would be an excellent framework for um, having Katie talk about her experience because it's so much in harmony with uh, the spirit of the work, with the spirit of inquiry. So I created a somewhat free version of the Diamond Sutra because I thought that the current translations, which are all um, scholarly and somewhat academic, are, are, were very hard to penetrate. I, I had that experience myself when I was a very young Zen student in the early 70s, and I've, I've known people who have tried to read it a number of times and have given up really early uh, because it was so impenetrable. So once I had my version finished, which I tried to make as accessible as possible, I read it to Katie. She loved it. And then we began to sit for, for a while well, every day. I, I more than loved it. I wept. It was, and as Stephen would question me about, you know, speak to it, speak out of your own experience to it when he'd read me a chapter, I would so often say one word that any word that I would add to that would take away. There's nothing needed there. And I, um, I, I really want to say, I, I really want to say that because it's so. And Stephen encouraged me. I respectfully disagreed. <laughs> he, he, I, I he, thought it was marvelous that she was and he illuminating has, it. And I trust Stephen. And so I would just follow the simple directions. Just he'd ask and I'd respond out of out of my own experience. And and so we have a mind at home with itself. And I and I, you know, I insisted because I thought the stories of Katie of Katie's awakening and of her learning to be human again or for the first time and from her perspective were so um, um, such a, a great help for people to understand the sutra and the essence of Buddhism, really, uh, because they gave flesh and blood to these sometimes abstract notions or notions which might be a little difficult to grasp for some people. And uh, the stories are, are, in my experience, riveting and challenging and uh, beautiful and vivid. And so I would, I would ask questions about anything in the sutra that seemed to me to be a little abstract or a little difficult to grasp and, and point her in a particular direction. And then when I had a, um, acquired a, a, a mass of material, I would begin to um, 
massage it from spoken English into written English. We sometimes joke that uh, Katie's the only living person that I've translated um, <laughs> after, after all these ancient texts. Um, but but the the challenge and the and the joy of that was to find a balance between what was meticulously accurate to her experience, which sometimes could be almost um, unintelligible because it was so qualified and so beautifully um, beautifully complicated that it was it was hard to grasp. And between that, what was what was accurate and what was comprehensible. So threading the line between them was was uh, an interesting challenge. And um, I loved it and she's happy with it. Um, so there we are, that's how it got written. I feel like uh, the way your hands are formed is how it got written. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's a story in the book that I would love, I'd love it if you would share, because so many people are so engaged in a lot of vitriolic conversations with people on opposite ends of political spectrum. And there's just a lot of very painful conversation happening and not happening. And there's a story in the book about a woman that you worked with, who you helped, whose husband came storming into your home in a, with a lot of threatening yeah. presence. Yeah. And I wonder if you could recount that so that we could hear what it's like to meet that kind of rage and threatening threateningness with this mind of no mind. Well, his, um, his wife... I was agoraphobic, so my doors were locked, my curtains were drawn, you know, for, for years, and and uh, so isolated. So then um, words started to get out from one to the other to the other, so people wanted to... to this is after your experience. Yeah, yeah. and people wanted to to talk to me, and, and um, so... It, here I am from one life to another, my doors unlocked, my windows open. And so everyone was invited. And, and um, so this woman would come and she was, she was just, her life was just shifting and shifting. And her husband was very upset. And as it, as it turned out, he was, um, um, in his words, a Kansas City cop, and we know what to do with people like you. And um, basically, to burn my house, no one would know it with my children in it. No one, you know, it was um, he was um, really quite something. And and what I saw was a, a terrified man. And bodies don't fool me. There, you know, that was just this in this like a terrified man. So I listened. Is what I did. I just listened and I, I could relate. He would say things and, and my mind, is he right? Is it true? Do I think that way? Do I do that? So his mind was not separate from my mind. If I'm if I can hear his voice, that's mine. That's not outside of me, that's in. So there was nothing going on but inquiry inside of me. So he is this 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 when this gale coming at me just and inside of me it's quiet just really you know it's ah and and so as as in that listening in that listening he whatever that was for him the i i think in in the, the buddhist would say i was experiencing compassion Mm -hmm. But there was a connection in that that no one has the power to break connection with me. What I'm thinking and believing is the only break in connection that can happen. So as he was, whatever happened for him in that silence of me, just so connected, um, unwaveringly, um, he began to sob and he uh, fell into your he arms. He fell into my arms and. And I mean, love is the power, and judgment is is like the mind's trick, saying, "Question me, question me." Notice the disconnect. You know, it's like a temple bell, mm -hmm. and um, 
And so um, in, in that connection, and, and whatever happened, she never came back. He never came back. Were you scared? Oh, no. No, I have, um, what self would be, what, what, it, it's like, if, if, if you imagine yourself at breakfast this morning, or getting up this morning, and you imagine yourself going to sleep tonight, I mean, what self are you? The self of the, the self there, because you can see an image of you, like you saw an image of you on the telephone. Mm -hmm. So that's a self. And then you're talking to me, that's a self, or that was a self. It's the self you're seeing now of the past. Mm -hmm. So you tonight, um, imagining going to bed from here now, that's a self. So who am I? Not that, not that, not that. You know, there's, there's, that's, those aren't objects, that's imagination. The point and is that when, when, so when she what wasn't... I fear? When she wasn't projecting a future, which she... Right. Doesn't do. But still, there can be no fear. But still, what self is he going to kill? That's the question. Right. You know, was I frightened? What self was he going to hurt? Now, yeah. if I imagine him coming back to burn down my house, and I'm not aware enough to know that that's mind play, then, then, oh my gosh, my children, oh my home, oh my gosh, I could burn alive, and but that's mind play. So, understanding that the difference simply between what's real and what's imagination, and then no answer to who am I is the answer. Not that. Not that. It's um. It's um. It's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing because it will give you self, 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 self. <laughs> I understand the words you're saying, and I'm seeing the logic, but I can't imagine. Mm -hmm. I, I personally, I, but it, it is uh, really. Well, if you look at it and, and look at it simply, like he's threatening to burn down the house with, with my children I in it at a time when we'll never suspect it, okay? Right. So what self is he going to burn? What children is he going to burn? What could I fear? pain yeah but but that's my children are you know those are false selves in my head in the moment am i going to leave this man for falseness i mean what is he going to kill <laughs> i see you're asking that yeah. question like 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 it's so clear with it's the so okay it would be the self of the future <laughs> he's going to kill well that looks okay to me <laughs> because that is imagination. You know, if you spend enough time in Katie's fourth question, who would I be without that thought? Okay. You could, this becomes absolutely obvious to you, and there can be no fear because there's I no actually, future. I actually get that in a, in the moment that I ask mm -hmm. the question there. because there's only space. So the that's space. that's why there's such a practice. And and who am I without my story? You know, sitting there with the boxes and and look at you, how innocent you are. Mm -hmm. You don't know your own power, and there you are with everything you need. So if 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 compassion is an experience there, you know, it just this is just sitting in a moment of time, and the question is, who would I be in that situation without the thought? I need him to help me. Yeah. I just want to go back to what you said about compassion, that when you said, I guess that's what Buddhists would call compassion, then I'm going to start to look for questions from other humans that are not myself <laughs> or not, not myself or whatever. <laughs> um, uh, that to me sounds so I, might, mighty. I think you just caught false selves. <laughs> you did, didn't you? I did. You did. You did. <laughs> I love the description of compassion as there being no difference. Like, you know, I think sometimes I or people think, well, compassion is you hear something sad and you go, oh, that I'm sorry, or I feel sad about that. But it's really you feel the sadness in your own heart as your own somehow. 
there's no division. And there's no, there's no sadness as well. Well, that I'm going to have to think about. Well, if you, um, if you, um, if, if you, if, if something terrible, you're telling me that something terrible happened to you, let's say um, you, you lost a child or whatever it is. And I imagine what that would feel like if it were me. And I don't know I'm doing that. It's just that I, I see those images that I don't realize I'm seeing. And I see me without my child in the future. And I don't know that I'm seeing this. I'm, I'm feeling all of this as you're telling me your story. So I am, I am, um, I am connecting what that must feel like. So what I'm experiencing are those false images. Let's call them false images. And I'm experiencing that. And it's how I react when, I, when I'm witnessing that, when I'm believing that. And so I am completely disconnected from you. I'm not, I am not with you. I'm into self. Mm -hmm. So I cannot feel what you feel. What I love about separate bodies is that when you hurt, I don't. I can't. I can imagine what that feels like. Mm -hmm. But what I also love about it is when I hurt, you don't. Mm -hmm. So if I hurt, and that's everything from sadness to devastation, I am, I, I can put that on a judge and neighbor worksheet and wake myself up so that I am connected to you in your sorrow, in your pain, in your fear, in your sadness. It's um, what would disconnect me from you is on me. And that is a selfish state of mind if I think I'm feeling your pain. But it's what it's almost like if I don't suffer when you suffer, um, I don't love you. Mm. But suffering isn't love. Mm -mm. So um, when when we get this this these things straight, then I am left when you are hurt to serve you selflessly, and wisdom takes the whole thing over, and and it's fast. It can see. It can hear. It's not blind. So, um, um, but compassion, you know, we relate, and and um, but as Stephen says, there's there's no sadness in it or fear in it. When you talk about it, you talk about it several times mm -hmm. in the book, and you just mentioned it, and for example, uh, you said, uh oh, where did it go? Well, I don't have to tell you what you said. When I say I love you, there's no personality talking. It's self-love. I'm only talking to myself. More accurately, it is only talking to itself. That's a beautiful dance. There is no other. Yeah. So you, it You are is, only who I imagine you to be, so it's, it's always the self making love with the self. Your mind, another way of saying that is your mind, you belong to me. How can I say that? You are who I believe you to be. You can never be more or less. And another way I love to say it is, I am who you believe me to be. Mm -hmm. Let's say there, there are several thousand people listening. That There are several thousand different Susans, several thousand mm -hmm. different Byron Katie's and Stephen Mitchell's. And so... I am who you believe me to be. I can never be more or less. So if you don't love me, mm -hmm. and it's not personal if you do or don't because I'm in you. Mm -hmm. So if, if you don't love me, that's on you. So we can do better. We can do better. You know, this self-love leaves us, leaves us free to, to serve the beautiful thing about the beautiful thing about understanding the mind is you come out loving the world. And the world's internal, but you love it. Even under all circumstances, I can't find, um, I can't find um, an, an exception. But I'm always looking, and that's that beautiful um, inquiring mind. Right. I believe you completely. Here are... Um, a couple questions. May I share them with you? Uh, I don't know how to welcome some of the tragedies I've experienced as being something that is happening for me, not to me. Could you help me understand 
Thank you for your help, Katie. Well, I'd say, first of all, it's understandable. How could you? How could you? You know, when to deny pain is, um, that's not helpful. If I hurt, I hurt. And, and that is, you know, we just start from, from base one. But I can go back to those moments in time, just the way we saw you on the telephone, Susan. I can go back to those moments in time, and I can identify. I can get so still that I can identify in that situation what I was actually thinking and believing about the situation and 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 put those thoughts on a worksheet. And I can get still and ask myself, is it true? And sit in that. And 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 be open to what I'm shown. In other words, you don't have to guess, is it true or not? You'll be shown. You don't have to guess how you react when you believe the thought. It will be shown to you. You've you've in, in your world you have lived it. It's pain, it's suffering, it's separation, it's it's um it's it's great loss. It's um it's we we become bitter and old in our youth, and old age should be youthful. You know, where where the the the, the bodies, <laughs> you know, they they they're a bit worn, etc. To the eye, but the heart, the mind is new. It's new. It's always growing. It's it, it never ceases to be a child, even in its, in its maturity. So, sweetheart, that's that's what I did, and that's what I um, would suggest to anyone that's suffering is is um, is is simply that. And also, the work is all how to do the work is always free on the work.com. And that judge and able worksheet, no newsletter to sign up for, not nothing in your way. You just push print. It's yours, and there's no limit to that. And there's also a one belief at a time worksheet where you can, oh. you can fill in a judge and able worksheet and um, and move any concept there to the one belief at a time worksheet. And there, there are what I call training wheels there. You know, they're just kind of markers um, that, that kind of hold you in, in expanding your mind, like sub-questions to those questions. Mm. I, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. What's it called? One Belief at a Time? Uh-huh. I'd like to add one thing. Um, um, many of the thoughts around tragedy that people suffer from greatly are variations on the thought, this shouldn't have happened. Mm -hmm. So that's a very uh, powerful thought to question. Mm -hmm. And there's something else. Um, so Susan, look at the last one, statement number six on the Judge and Neighbor Worksheet. What did you write there? What is it about the situation that you don't want, don't ever want to experience again? Mm -hmm. I don't ever want to question my trust in him to care about me. Okay, I'm willing to and read it. I'm willing to. I'm willing to question my trust in him. Yeah, I'm to willing to me. want to question my trust I'm in Doug. Willing to. Yeah, I'm willing to. In other words, I'm, willing. I'm willing to doubt him again. What? I look um, for I look forward to. Okay. <laughs> I don't look forward to it. It could happen, and that's the point. Well, it you don't will happen. have a choice. So okay. if it happens again, mm -hmm. you know there's work to be done. It's another worksheet. It's not done until it's done. It will take us deeper and deeper. It's like I don't ever want... I don't ever want my children to be hurt. I'm willing that my children are hurt. I look forward that my children are hurt. Because if they're hurt and I suffer, it just becomes all about me. So it's not done until my children can be safe around me to be hurt. Mm. 
you know, our children get hurt and it becomes all about us Mm -hmm. until finally they can't even share things with us or they have to be careful. So I'm willing for uh, my children to be hurt. I look forward. You know, this is earth school. This, (laughs) This is earth school. And there is nothing that we, there's nothing that comes to mind that isn't for us. (laughs) <laughs> I I really love that. I really, really yeah. do. You know, if I can't love my thoughts, I can't love the world. If I don't understand my thoughts, then I'm not understanding the creation of everything. Everything that we apparently see. Let me give you another question, if I may. Mm-hmm. Because I could pause on that for a long time. This question is from Jenna. She says, I use the work in my I use the work in my own work as a nutrition therapist, particularly as it pertains to body image. For example, I'll never find love because of my body. Sometimes when we get to the question about whether something is absolutely true, it can be so difficult for them to not believe that their negative thought about themselves is inherently true. How can I help them see beyond this? Thank you. Well, when you're doing inquiry, like um, um, it's like if you if you if you had a choice, I want my body to be um, beautiful, healthy, flexible, or I want my thinking, my thoughts, to be beauty and beautiful and healthy and flexible. What would you choose if you had to make a choice, body or mind? Mind? And you, I mean, it's like a no-brainer. Right. And, and, but we take our bodies to, um, to the gym, and, and, you know, how often do we take our minds to the gym? How often do we question them? We just believe them like innocence. And that, that is the cause of all suffering in, in one's world. So um, how can um, I help my clients see beyond where you, I think there's a judge your body worksheet at thework.com. I'm not sure, but, but you can take a judge your navel worksheet and just judge the physical body. Like I, um, I am saddened or I'm hopeless because my body is too, you could say fat, thin, tall, short, old, young, ugly, beautiful. I mean, it's whatever it is for you. So I am saddened at my body because it is so ugly. So I question that. My body is ugly. Now, when you sit in my body is ugly, what body would that be? You close your eyes and you, you, you like, my body is too ugly. Well, the body that you're seeing in your mind's eye, no one has ever seen their body actually. No one has ever seen their body. We look in the mirror and and we put judgments on the mirror and and the, what we see in the mirror and we think that's us. That's crazy. That's crazy. <laughs> no one knows what they look like. And 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 are you are you ugly if you're not comparing your body as you see it with any other body in the world? You're beautiful. You mm-hmm. cannot be out of out of sync. It's impossible. So, and and don't believe me. Everyone test it for yourselves. But I want. Let's see. I'm I'm angry at my body because it is ugly. When we turn that around, I'm angry angry at my thoughts, my thinking about my body. Right. And, and so it just becomes obvious when you do a judge your body worksheet and where you have anywhere you have an object like body, a physical, uh, an object, then you put my thoughts or my thinking. But if you, um, if you fill in a worksheet and you do only the turnarounds and only those substitutes, it is, it's very tempting, but it, that's not that's not the work. It'll just, it'll set you free for a while and, and, and your unworked thoughts will override it, override that enlightenment, just like they're overriding your wisdom now. So, um, so question them. Do it all. Don't miss the questions. And then when you turn around, you, you, you're more educated as you go from statement one. Then you have a more enlightened mind to go to statement two. 
And then you have those two that you've said, and you have a more enlightened mind that you're taking to question three, a more enlightened mind that you're taking to four on the worksheet, and five and six. So um, I, I just, I just, um, I didn't skip any, and I don't skip any, and I invite people, I mean, without comparison, you know, just love the one you're with. There's, a, there's, there's another point here, too, um, if I may. Mm -hmm. um, the question is, how can you help your clients see beyond the thought that, for instance, my body should be healthier? There's a temptation when a client answers uh, to the question, is it true, or can you absolutely know it's true that my body should be healthier? And, and they answer yes. There's a temptation to want to nudge them toward a no. Huh. And Katie often emphasizes that it, yes is just as good an answer as no. Okay. It'll and, all show up as we go. And the point is that the 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 questions of the work are are as it were stacked. Even if you say yes and are totally convinced at that point of the, asking yourself the second question that it's absolutely true what you're thinking. Yeah, by it's the okay to say yes. By the time you uh, sink into the third question, how do I react? What happens when I believe that thought and see the cause and effect of believing mm -hmm. the thought? Then see beyond the thought in the fourth question and then see how the opposites of the thought, my body shouldn't be healthier, for example, are just as true as the original thought. Mm -hmm. At that point, once you've gone through the whole process, there's a, a great possibility that your yes will have deteriorated, disintegrated by that point, and you'll mm -hmm. see something more. So without, without helping, quote unquote, your clients see beyond the thought at the beginning, you're actually doing them a great service, just mm -hmm. as your husband did you a service mm -hmm. by not helping? Um, that you let them find their own answers, and it's all it, it's 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 embedded in the way the questions are. Honey, stacked. that's so important. That is so important. That's just such beautiful, accurate guidance. Just you know, yes, okay. So I'm hopeless. Okay, can I absolutely know that it's true? I'm too ugly. Yes, yes. Okay, so just just. Notice and move to the next one. Notice how you react when you believe the thought. Get still. And you meditators, again, you have you have such a beautiful head start. Just witness with your eyes closed how you react when you believe the thought that you're questioning. Get the notice in that situation that you've anchored on, just like just like Susan and at the phone with the boxes, her sitting on the floor. Anchor, that's the anchor. And who would you be without the thought? And then, and then turn it around. Try those turnarounds on like a new pair of shoes. <laughs> I love that. Mm -hmm. I think we have time for one more, okay. if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. This is from Karen. Karen says, I've been following the work and, and listened to many of your podcasts. It's so helpful in so many ways. But here is where I get confused. I understand how we project our stories onto ourselves and to others. But at what point do we stop finding turnarounds and realizing and realize that the situation is just not okay? I feel like the turnaround process makes me find excuses to tolerate a person or situation when perhaps I'm better off just walking away and changing a situation. I get so mixed up with the turnaround part. Yeah. So, um, you know, the, the work is it's 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 a body of work and it's it's a way of sitting in a meditation from beginning to end and it's you know i refer to it often as checkmate and it's you know we don't you know if you just go to turnarounds the eagle loves that it is just gonna just override you all over the place so we're just um just um, i invite you just to slow down and start with is is it true and and to remember that uh, this work is done with eyes closed, and and I invite you, um, you, the one that that just addressed the question or asked the question, that you uh, find maybe just twenty minutes in in the morning just to sit in one question, even just part of it, and mm. and begin somewhere, and just take it on as a practice, and have an amazing day, an amazing life. 
I would add something to that. Um, when you do the work on a situation that you feel is not okay, um, if you if you do if you ask the question sincerely, if you f actually first frame the thoughts clearly and then ask the question sincerely, where you'll end up is not with a prescription to stay or leave. Um, what what you'll end up with is an open heart and a love towards the person whom you were at first angry at or disappointed with and it, it, there are no there's no prescription for for a particular action there there is a uh, a process of uh, unraveling thoughts that may not be true thoughts that are causing you suffering and once you are able to unravel those thoughts uh, most people, many people who are doing the work sincerely find that it becomes absolutely clear what to do in the situation. You cannot know beforehand. You can think a situation is not okay and it may be okay. It may not be okay. But after you've subjected these thoughts that cause suffering to uh, thoroughgoing inquiry, the clarity that you get at the end of that process is something that allows you to um, to effortlessly know what to do and oh. it's it's resolved in the clarity and you cannot have predicted that beforehand so the I would clear add that. the mind the the you know the choices we make you know, should I, shouldn't I, this is right, this is wrong. The choices we make, and as we continue inquiry, it just becomes effortless. It's, it's um, you know, we, it's the clear of the mind, the clear our choices. Like, like, why do we have to hate each other to divorce? Why can't we just love each other and, 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 and share each other's lives if we are single or, or marry someone else. I mean, why do we have to be enemies to divorce or separate? It's just, you know, we can do that. Um, we can do that without being enemies. Or, or, or I can do that without being It's okay if my partner has a problem with it. Mm -hmm. He he is not my he is not my enemy and I'm not his enemy, whatever his perception. Right. And people people who are deeply in the work know from experience that it's possible to divorce someone with absolute love, with, with never never any anger, or to to experience the death of a beloved parent or a beloved of any sort without a trace of sadness, with just love. This is, you know, this is what happens when you uh, f free yourself from uh, believing anything you think. It, it becomes beautiful always, whatever the experience. And also, um, you know, at that nine-day school for the work, people come in. They, they, people are actually, it seems to me, learning to come to the school for the work before they divorce, <laughs> or it's just, or it's, it's. Just, but, you know, by the time they leave, they know who they're divorcing. You know, no yeah. two people have ever met. But when you meet yourself, you know, then you're, um, you're, you, you can see others more clearly when you um, are privileged and open enough to see yourself clearly, which always shows up in the work. Where can people go to learn more about the work, the worksheets, the nine-day school, and so on. What if people want to take the next step to explore the work? What do you suggest? Um, that they um, first, the work is free on thework.com. If I have anything of value, it is free there. And so I just don't believe that anyone can ever own it or have to pay for it. And other than your identity, it may cost you that. But, uh, <laughs> but that's not a bad thing. Mm -hmm. And but um, they can look at the events, you know, the events calendar on the work dot com. Mm -hmm. And I have one coming up. It's I call it the nobody, and it is um, 
it's it's very very different than um, the school for the work and the school oh. for the work is a, a nine day experience where we work on fear and terror and we work on relationships and we work on um, the, the things we're most ashamed of and men prejudice and, and, and men and women and if you know the what humans what we stumble over those big things i have like capsules and we go from we do one capsule from start to finish and then we we just step into another one and another one and it is um, it's um it's like a checkmate school it is it's um i love that school oh. i love that school and we have um we have um, also, um, scho- some scholarships available oh. for the school, so that um, you know, with these tuitions, we can play it forward. And that's great. And it's um, it's if anyone, if anyone, you know, has the 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 a, a way of taking nine days out of their life, and they have the 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 money for it, um, or the um, um, they can take that time up. If they can carve those nine days out, then it's, um, I just can't imagine anyone, it's it's not true, I can't imagine it, but but for myself, I, you know, living in this world, I can't imagine spending the rest of my life without doing that school first, because that mm. the school is comprised of my first three years. That's where mm. all the exercise come, come out of. Wow. But it's that worth, sounds amazing. It's worth it saying really again is. that, that there are complete and detailed instructions about how to do the work with lots of videos of Katie yeah. on, on the work.com yeah. free of charge. Also, I have a, a helpline on the work.com. Oh, cool. And, and, um, and they don't ask your name. They don't ask where you're from. And you just fill in a worksheet. You just print it free of charge and you call and they'll work. They'll, they'll work with you. Um, absolutely. Just, freely you don't have to sign up for anything or even say your name and um and if you don't know if you just can't fill in the worksheet because your mind is too busy then you can also call the helpline and they'll help you fill in the worksheet that's so cool yeah. that is so cool and then also we also have people that have been to a minimum of two school for the works two nine-day school for the works and they've been through the certification program where they're all uh, they evaluate each other, self evaluation. So no one, no one, uh, all together, um, they determine who's certified this community, and their oh. their um, their um, profiles are also on the work dot com, and you can see the things that they've worked through that they thought that they just could never get through, and you might have some of that in common, and maybe that's a facilitator you want to call. Also, if you have people in other language that don't speak English, there's so there. Oh my goodness, there's so many um, language of certified facilitators on the work.com. So, uh, hopefully, something for everyone. That's great. That's great. Uh, and of course, this book, a mind, mind at home with itself, yeah, that, which was the basis for this conversation, yeah. and has this beautiful picture on it. Mm-hmm. And I just uh, thank you so, so much for your time, for your, the way you hold hands, <laughs> for your um, wisdom and your generosity. Uh, and thank you very thank much. You. Susan, um, thank you. And what I appreciate is to see such a, such a, such an amazing teachers yourself so humble that you would just fill in a worksheet and just do your work and I just it touches me very deeply very Thank touching you oh yeah. that's very kind and brave and brave too and, and, oh you guys yeah that's very nice maybe, thank you maybe not brave for you but certainly certainly um, for some of us it would be radically courageous I'm very touched by that. Thank you. Thank you. I will um, be thinking of you both with so much warmth and uh, just open heartedness and um, 
again, I thank you. And I thank you on behalf of the Open Heart Project for just being here with us mm -hmm. and helping us connect our whole life as the practice, um, cushion yeah. or no cushion. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Susan. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.